the horse is uh, an animal like no other, so I am probably a moderator like no other. I lack experience, so I hope you will be kind to me. I'm not very good in that exercise, and I do not have the oral talent of uh, Sylvie Brunel or uh, Sylvine Piquel Chevalier, who are brilliant academicians who came before me. I will probably be a lot more uh, brief, and I will start by calling onto the stage the various speakers. We have five of them. Here they are. Sophie Yanou Gillet, are you around? Please come on stage. Dr. Paul Kahn, please come on stage as well. I don't know how I should be uh, enunciating your name. Kahn or Khan? Stefan Schumann, my friend, please come on stage. And uh, Yaroslav Müller. Yaroslav, you are being called on stage. Please join us. And also Thierry Gosseron, please come on stage. The great Thierry Gosseron. Now, please be seated. My main role in um, this round table will be uh, if you let me, to maybe rethink the order of uh, speakers. I would like to group them in two packs. Sorry for the word pack. One's to talk about equestrian tourism, and the two speakers in charge of this exercise are both uh, French speakers, even though uh, Stéphane Schumann is German, but he uh, will be speaking in French. And then we will have the two next uh, uh, speech uh, talking about the horse world. And then we will be concluding with a communication on Versailles that uh, will be in 2024 the world or the Olympic capital of horse riding. Now, Sophie Yanou, I will give you the floor without further ado. Sophie Yanou, or you can stay seated. It's up to you. Please. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for having invited me to this round table on tourism. I represent the Departmental Tourism Agency. Uh, this is a body that answers to the Departmental Council. The horse, an animal like no other, how true that is. The horse is not a domestic animal, but it is an animal that can be used for mediation, i.e. it is a tool that allows for uh, the meeting between man and the horse, but also meetings between different territories. The horse is truly an animal, a tool, an animal that uh, is fully the flavor of tourism today. Tourism can be described in four words, nature, slow, slowness, discovery, and experience. And the horse, with uh, its rider, can amble through numerous uh, country lanes, taking its time, seeing things that one wouldn't normally see and stopping at certain uh, architectural or natural heritage sites. So the horse is the epitome of being able to live this itinerant life that people want today. And Monsieur Touron was saying earlier that uh, we have managed to create uh, the pathway of uh, the Loire Valley for bicycles. And we absolutely have to be able to have the same type of uh, itinerant pathway for horses for two main reasons. Uh, it's, a, it's been a great challenge, uh, partly because it's relatively new. Uh, before, these types of uh, people who set off on horseback tended to do it alone, whereas these days, they want to do it in groups. And in order to uh, manage to do this and to trek over great difference, uh, great uh, distances, you have the D'Artagnan pathway. Uh, we do have uh, other pathways. Uh, the, uh, we have the departmental park of Lille-Briand, which is also a, a very big uh, 
uh, park that uh, promotes the development of the horse. We have a renowned race. We have the race in Lyon. We have the horse fair that will be taking place, that takes place in Angers uh, every November. So I don't think that the horse can be forgotten. But if you want to be itinerant on horseback, you need certain roads, pathways, infrastructure, centers uh, for uh, for resting up in the evening, for stabling your horse. And the difficulty is that uh, you have to intertwine the development of the paths or the roads themselves and the development of services. It's uh, the role of the departmental agencies and the tourist uh, agencies to cover this. But we see these days that this idea of itinerant uh, holidays is a difficult one. Difficult because you need uh, private partners to invest in the necessary infrastructure for uh, stabling and welcoming the uh, uh, the tourists, and also you need the participation of the different municipalities along the pathway. And a lot of these municipalities have not yet understood exactly uh, how much these uh, horse riders could bring to their own territories. And also to develop these paths, uh, you need uh, the paths to be of an excellent quality. And in the Anjou region, we're working with a partner who's invaluable to us, and that is uh, the Regional Equestrian Tourism Committee. Madame Boutet is present here today. And uh, through working with them, we can certify the quality of these paths. And that is the number one necessity for this type of tourism. They, it requires more and more quality infrastructure. We talk about the need to develop this uh, uh, horse riding tourism in the Anjou uh, region. And in our new uh, plans, what we have uh, uh, foreseen is not just to continue to develop the D'Artagnan pathway, but also to help the municipalities to keep the little um, rural towpaths properly uh, uh, properly maintained uh, to ensure that uh, there, are, there is the necessary infrastructure for the tourists and for their, uh, their horses. These are the things that we will have to make sure exist if we truly want uh, equestrian tourism to be recognized as uh, bike riding tourism is recognized today, particularly because in this region we have everything for it to be a success. Uh, in, uh, as of today, we have more than 300 kilometers of uh, horse riding paths, the D'Artagnan pathway, but also other paths that are being developed. I keep talking about the D'Artagnan pathway. It's a European pathway. That is what uh, makes it stand out. It's a cultural pathway. It's a natural pathway. But it is the DNA uh, that uh, links all of these different territories. The territories are linked together because of the D'Artagnan pathway. So we are hoping to do more or less the same type of thing in our department. We want to develop these uh, horse riding paths, and we want to be able to promote them nationally and internationally. Thank you very much, and thank you for having been succinct. In fact, uh, you had two minutes left over if you had wanted to use them, but maybe we can use it at the end. So we're now going to leave the Anjou region, and we're going to move now to uh, wander through the rest of the world. And I'm going to ask my friend Stefan Schumann, who is here, who recently published a book in Germany. Uh, he is uh, suggesting Around the World on Horseback. And the book is a lovely title. It's called Happiness on Earth. But the French editor, publisher, found that that wasn't uh, pretty enough, and he called it Around the World on a Horse. So I can but recommend it. Stefan, would you like to come and speak to us once again? He lives in Berlin. He's German. That's a lot of faults, but he does have one quality. He speaks French. Thank you. Merci, Jean-Louis. <laughs> oui, bonjour à tous. Hello, everybody. I, too, would like to talk about uh, horse tracking as uh, a wonderful example of soft tourism, slow tourism, 
And uh, maybe I could entitle what I'm going to say, goodbye to asphalt. Since we have started using horses, horse trekking is what uh, suits animals the most. It's uh, wandering through the steep, uh, but it also is something that suits uh, mankind wandering through the savanna. We've actually been wandering since prehistoric times. Uh, the sedentary life is an illness of uh, modern civilization. And horse trekking is the symbiosis between these two species, uh, mankind and the horse, happy together. It, I don't think I need to tell you that uh, trekking with horses or, or with uh, mules uh, has great potential for tourism, for culture, uh, for therapy and for economy. And when I talk about therapy, I'm not just talking about uh, horse riding for the handicapped. We are all handicapped after all. We are all uh, cut off from our natural rhythms of life. Uh, Jean-Marie talks about that in his wonderful essay, uh, The Horse, The Future. There are a lot of facets that I could talk about today, but unfortunately, I have to choose just one or two this afternoon. And I would like to talk about the pathways, the trails. Often, we don't think about uh, these paths or these trails, but they are so important for uh, horse trekking. Up until the end of the 19th century, Europe was crisscrossed by a, by a spider's web of these little towpaths. Some of them have been used uh, since the end of the glass age, of the ice age, sorry, uh, by uh, different uh, men and women. And then there was the competition of the railways, uh, the motor car and other infrastructure, and all of these pathways uh, were uh, deteriorated, but some of them uh, in the Alps or in the Pyrenees, have kept uh, their uh, their towpaths, and particularly these uh, towpaths that are used uh, for uh, animals. These little paths are monuments to mobility, and the best way of uh, preserving them is to keep using them. In my book, I talk about uh, some of the trips that I have done, for example, in Albania and southern Tyrol or elsewhere. When we do big uh, horse treks, several days at least, sometimes several weeks, we are very attentive to the trails that we choose to follow, not just because of tradition, except for some of them that are classical, such as the Cherchart path, but because they are much more agreeable for the horse's hooves but also for our backsides. And I hope that that is the right term to use in the right place this afternoon. It's the most important part of our bodies, after all. But it's also the most agreeable for our eyes and for our ears. Yes, of course, you can also wander over asphalt. And sometimes you can't avoid having to use uh, certain uh, asphalt roads during your horse treks. But for the ears, the asphalt is a torture. However, if you are riding over an earthen trail that is a very variable, elastic, and dynamic sound, even on paves, paving stones, the sound of uh, hooves is completely different. On asphalt, it is nothing but sound, noise. It is noise. Whereas on paving stones, it's music. It's like a percussionist. And it uh, is for these acoustic and rhythmic qualities that we appreciate uh, horse tracks. And that is where the therapeutic uh, uh, aspect of horse tracking comes into it. These old pathways are also part of our heritage, and they are absolutely vital if you want to uh, ride anywhere uh, on horseback. These paths tell their own stories. 
in Iceland, for example, we followed paths that can actually be found in some of the historic uh, Icelandic sagas, the old stories. So you're right in the heart of regional literature. Uh, the, uh, as like horses, these paths tell us stories, but the paths are, all, are also extremely international because they are far older than all nations and all borders. A pathway is uh, the opposite of a frontier. And then you also have uh, the, you have a Via Storia, which is an, uh, a great inventory of historical pathways uh, of great cultural and touristic value. And in Austria at the moment, we are beginning to launch a very similar project. Over the last few years at the same time, more and more of these long distance uh, horse trails have actually been mapped out. We've talked about the D'Artagnan pathway. Uh, there is another big uh, one from Nubek to Stettin, Stettin, or some of the towering peaks of the Balkans, which I also talk about in my book. These are romantic uh, corridors. And uh, these corridors offer us the fascination of traveling, and they embellish Europe. So my message today is say goodbye to asphalt and respect and love our pathways, because they are the true Europeans. Thank you very much. Voilà le livre de... And here's Stefan's book, published in French, French, in, Fran in French, sorry, all of the information on the cover. And uh, as you can see, he is a poet at heart. He also published uh, a big book uh, in Germany and in German, uh, an, a novel on the Przelewski horse, the prehistoric horse, what for a long time we called the prehistoric horse. So this is the book you need if you're interested in that. Thank you very much. I'd now like to give the floor to Paul Kahn. You're going to love his elegance as well. Mr. Kahn is the Secretary General of the European and Mediterranean Horse, Raiding, Horse Racing Federation, the EMHF. He's a member of the Executive Board of the Horse Racing International Federation, which is uh, the uh, top uh, uh, thoroughbred uh, horse racing world. And he represents the British Horse Racing Authority within his technical and advisory committee, of which he is vice chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jean-Louis. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Lovely to be here. Um, it was Kemal Ataturk, the towering Turkish leader of a century or so ago, still revered to this day in Turkey, who said, horse racing is a social need for modern societies. A social need. So that's quite a claim. Uh, and I want to explore why he might have said that um, and why he might actually have been right. Um, there's something almost primal, isn't there, about the concept of racing horses. Humans have been testing whether my horse is faster than your horse for millennia. There's evidence of horse racing in what is now Kazakhstan, dating back to 4000 BC. Um, and by 600 BC, horse races were, of course, part of the Olympic Games. Today, racing is big business, partly because it is, I think, the most professionalized of the equine endeavors. The trainers are professional, so are the jockeys, the jockeys' agents, the stable staff, and so on. And partly because of the unique link to betting. Soon after the instinct uh, to brag, my horse is better than your horse, came the instinct that says, I bet I know who's going to win this race. 
And while it is true that there is no betting in some of the richest racing nations in the world, in most places, including throughout Europe, racing and betting are inseparable. We recently estimated that the economic impact of racing alone in Europe is over 21 billion euros per annum. Now, the received wisdom is that it takes perhaps between five and seven horses to generate each full-time job. In racing, the, the, the formula is very different. There's around one full-time job for every horse in training. And when you take into account all the indirect and associated uh, employment, like the betting, this rises in some countries to about four or five jobs for every horse in training. But if we just concentrate on the numbers, I think we miss the real significance of racing culturally, the real reason why Atatürk called it a social need. I spent the week before last at Cheltenham, uh, as I always do, uh, for what to me is the greatest race meeting in the world. For those of you who don't know, it's the biggest jump race meeting on the planet. And over four days, around 300,000 people attend. Every race is televised. The main results are featured on our national terrestrial news. Talk of Cheltenham is everywhere. And to the community who live in the relatively sleepy town of Cheltenham, it is a life changer. And much the same can be said about Ascot in the summertime. But it isn't only in those countries where there are large-scale racing industries, like France, like Ireland, like Great Britain, that there are examples of a race meeting becoming part of the fabric of the society. I remember the first international meeting that I attended after I joined the EMHF. It was in Belgium, where, which doesn't have a great deal of racing, at a pristine little Flemish town called Vergem. They have racing just one day a year when they ran the biggest jump race in Belgium, the Grand Steeplechase of Flanders. And around midday, bollards were set up on every access road into the town. All the shops shut. The whole town closes for business because everybody is at the races. But I think the, the cultural significance of, of racing goes deeper than this. I believe it is a unifying endeavor which transcends religious and cultural differences, and it's a symbol of normalcy. I want to give you two examples of what I mean. The first is from Lebanon. Lebanon's a country of, of great religious diversity. There are 18 recognized religious groups, each with their own family law legislation and set of religious courts. Since independence, 1943, the National Pact guarantees that all these groups have representation in the corridors of power. But for 15 years between 1975 and 1990, the country was racked by civil war. And a green line developed in Beirut, the capital, separating the Christian East from the Muslim West. And smack bang on that green line was the race course. Two years into the war, it was decided to re-establish racing. 12,000 people defiantly turned up. And from then, for several years, rather than the course becoming a no-go area, as you might have expected, it actually became the only place where people from opposite sides of the green line could meet each other, united in their love of the sport. And it became a symbol of national unity and a peaceful Christian-Muslim coexistence. There's a wonderful short film. You can see it on YouTube. It's German-made, uh, which describes this very well. It's called Stories from No Man's Land. At one point, there's a story of a, a former fighter who was ordered by his boss near the start of the war to plant a bomb on the racetrack. 
So he went to check the place out. He'd never been racing before. And he says, suddenly, everyone got up, Muslims and Christians together, and started waving their arms around. And then they sat down. I was troubled, he said. All I saw were simple people. Muslims and Christians joined together. He refused to carry out that mission, and the bomb was never planted on the racetrack. And for several years, racing continued for most of the time. And at the president's request, race meetings took place during the worst of the Civil War fighting. And when they were on, the shooting would subside, only to start up again once the spectators had gone home. E extraordinarily, there was never any trouble at the track, and the course was even used as a venue for peace talks. Uh, 1982, the Israeli invasion destroyed the stands, but they were rebuilt in the 90s just after the war. But just because the war was over, it didn't mean that the threats to the racetrack were over. The civil authorities wanted to capitalize on its prime location in the middle of Beirut and use it for a new presidential palace. But there was a concerted and spirited campaign to save the track, which attracted great public support. The French were instrumental in saving it. Even Jacques Chirac got involved, doubtless because he appreciated the symbolic and healing properties of horse racing. And my other example, my last example, is Libya. You'll remember how Libya descended into turmoil and civil war after Gaddafi's overthrow. However, despite the chaos and the conflict, horse racing has staged a remarkable recovery in that country. Seemingly at the very first opportunity, races were being organized again and were attracting big, big crowds. And remarkably, Libya is this year going to stage one of the most valuable races in Europe. The Libya World Cup is due to be run in Tripoli in December, and it'll be worth nearly a million euros, financed through government support. And I firmly believe that the reason is that racing is a symbol of normalcy and is seen to be by enlightened administrations. I liken it sometimes to the desert flowers, which after years of inactivity at the first drop of rain come into bloom again. Um, and I hope, I really hope that when the horrors that are going on in Ukraine are behind us, that horse racing in that country will start up again. I hope so because as Atatürk said, horse racing is a, a social need. Thank you. Bravo, bravo, merci beaucoup. Very well done, wonderful speech, wonderful illustration. Thank you so much. Sir, it is your turn, Mr. Yaroslav Müller, who is uh, the president of uh, the Pardubice races, the president of uh, the Czech Republic, and also with the tradition of steeplechase for over 150 years. He also uh, represents Euro Ecus, the network of horse cities in Europe, and Sumir joined it in 2021. You have the floor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to say that I am very pleased to be here today in such a nice place, in such a great company. It's an honor for me. Today I am representing the town of Pardubice, also known as the town of uh, horses. I'm also representing the race course in Pardubice. That's the place where the great steeplechase named Velka Pardubicka is held since 1874, which is also a nice, uh, nice uh, event to, to visit. What I would like to say, uh, today we heard very interesting and sophisticated uh, presentations from my colleagues. We heard a lot of about the 
different kind of uh, horse breeds, different type of horses, veterinary, veterinary rules, economy, legislature, and other. For me, the most important thing in the 21st century is the horse welfare. That's a topic that was repeated today quite a lot, and that's very good, especially for me, for a person who is responsible for race course in Pardubice. And when I say race course in Pardubice, that means steeper chase and cross country, of course. It is our duty to create the safe and comfortable conditions for all horses competing wherever on the world. And that's our task for next, next season, for, for next years. Uh, as we all certainly know, during the past two years, we have gone through very difficult times as far as the COVID-19 is concerned. I do not want to speak about the, the, bad, uh, the bad impact on the organizers. We all know that we have been canceling our events. We know that we have been running without all audience. I do hope it's, it is all over and we can focus on the new season that I hope is going to be in the, in the, normal, in the normal way. There are also some other sides of the COVID. For instance, and that's what I would like to say, is that the situation in the Czech Republic has been influenced by COVID. It is clear that the popularity of the horses in general and the related activities has been increasing during the COVID times. The same applies to the other statistics, such as the number of equestrian competitions and issues license. The equestrian sport has become a permanent part of TV coverage, which we didn't know since that time. The Czech Republic has returned to the Olympics with a complete horse jump team after 85 years, which is a great news. As far as the situation with racing, and again, I mean racing, steeplechase, and cross country is uh, following. The situation is a, bit, uh, is a little bit more complex as the operation is very costly. The flat races have stagnated and local breeding of the English thoroughbred can hardly compete with the traditional horse breeding on the British Islands and in France. The most famous continental cross country steeplechase, Velká Pardubická, which has been organized since 1874, is still a very popular and prestige event, and the fame of Velká Pardubická helps other steeplechase organizers to promote their activities, which is the good side. There is an, another good information for us. During the difficult days, we know the, from the statistic that on the TV, we have a bunch of 2.5 million people watching this great steeplechase only in the region of the Czech Republic. I do hope that we will be able to invite all of these people this year at the race course in Pardubice. And since I know that not all of you were watching this race course on TV. So the invitation is also for you, and I will be more than happy to see you in Pardubice. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. We uh, accept your invitation with Thank you very much. We accept your invitation with great pleasure. And uh, to finish uh, with a bang, we are going to talk about Versailles, which will be the world capital of the horse for the next Olympic uh, Games. We're going to listen now to Mr. Thierry uh, Gosseron, who is competent, not only because he's the general administrator of uh, the Chateau de Versailles, but he is also a horse breeder. And his dream is to participate in the Olympic Games. I think it's a little late for you to do it now, my friend. But Thierry, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you very much, Jean-Louis. Thank you, Alain, jean Roc, Florence, Claire. Thank you, everybody, for this uh, invitation and this absolutely perfect organization, apart from the temperature, a little on the cold side. 
I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. But I just have uh, one little bit of information I'd like to give you. The uh, school where you find yourself here today, back in uh, 1793, just after the revolution and during the Terreur, there was uh, uh, a stable hand called La Ville de Villeneuve. And then he called himself Citizen Labine after the revolution. And uh, he suggested uh, to the health committee to create a school of national equitation. And he didn't receive any answer, of course, but uh, it just goes to show that the ideas for creating this school went way back before what you can see on the plaque at the entrance. Talking about agriculture, sports, and culture, talking about the horse that uh, is an animal like no other, uh, maybe I would do better to answer the question, why are we thinking of holding the Olympic Games in Versailles for the horsing of horse events? Now, we talk about uh, animal welfare, the welfare of horses. That is one of the prime uh, conditions for holding these uh, uh, equestrian uh, games in Versailles. I remember that uh, when we were talking about, uh, back in the day, when we were talking about uh, having the uh, uh, the candidacy for uh, the Olympic Games, uh, why the, you had the Eiffel Tower. Uh, back in the day, the, the Grand, Grand Palais wasn't there. And therefore, without asking permission of anybody, the minister or the uh, uh, the town hall, because there's an old saying that says it's always better to ask for forgiveness rather than ask for permission to do something. And that's what we did with Francois. Now, everybody is delighted now at the initiative of having the uh, Olympic Games in uh, Versailles. But at the beginning, it was a very risky uh, uh, challenge. And I think that it was what uh, weighed in the balance uh, for us to win out over Los Angeles and other uh, cities. We couldn't do any other sport, sports th at Versailles. There was no reason to do uh, uh, any of the uh, javelo or uh, weightlifting. Uh, the, in Versailles, in the, in the castle, in the chateau itself, we have uh, old parquet. Uh, the uh, the sky over the the uh, chateau is still the same as it might have been 200 years ago. But the other thing that is still the same as uh, hundreds of years ago is the presence of horses. We have the chateau. We have uh, the town of Versailles that is a green town. And in 1665 uh, uh, and in other towns just around Versailles as well. And several years uh, later, there uh, the, uh, this, um, these, uh, the stud farm moved from Versailles to the Ara du Pain. The Ara du Pain was something that Louis XIV wanted to build, but was actually built by Louis XV. And the Ara du Pain is what we call the Versailles uh, of horses. Uh, I hope not, because it means the Ara du Pain would be uh, just as well known as Versailles, which, after all, would be probably be an excellent thing. Louis the Thirteenth, Louis the Fourteenth, back in the day, bought their horses from abroad. Uh, Two thirds of them were Arabians. They were uh, Barb's. They were Turkish horses, and they had to uh, import broodmares to actually uh, have the right uh, mounts uh, for hunting, uh, for war, for education, for um, hacking. And when I looked back into the history of Versailles, I was interested to see that everything that we do today is actually something that has already been done in the past. We have reinvented permaculture, which was the way that uh, plants were actually protected uh, hundreds of years ago. And the same thing goes for horses. When you look at uh, the uh, all of the big uh, equestrian treaties, there is always part of these treaties that talks about um, taking care of the horse. They didn't call it welfare back then. They talked about taking care of the horses. In one of these treaties, it was actually said that to, to be a good groom or to be a good breeder, you have to be in love with horses. Now, there's nothing rational about that. It's not an essential criterion in uh, uh, the uh, horsemanship traditions. But there has always been, over centuries, this idea of having to love the horse if you wanted to work with the horse. In Versailles, there are lots of other things as well. 
We have uh, managed to reintroduce the horse uh, into uh, Versailles. Of course, you can see it in all of the artworks, all of the paintings. It would be very difficult to have a president of the Republic painted on horseback these days, but in the past, it was absolutely natural in a lot of the uh, paintings that you can see here in uh, the Cadre Noir. You can see them as well without stirrups, because without stirrups, it was considered to be more noble. And uh, uh, war horses uh, were... Uh, were often shown, and you have uh, the best well-known uh, painting, that of Mignard, and the, the Battle of Maastricht. I think that this is one of the most beautiful horse paintings where you have a true um, osmosis between man and the animal. Uh, there was always, there's always been this relationship with the animal. So we have tried to bring the horse back into Versailles, not just uh, in paintings and in sculptures, but actually in real life. We have uh, Bartaba, you've probably heard of uh, the uh, entertainment, uh, the, the shows that Bartabas uh, puts on in Versailles. We also have carriage rises. Uh, 260,000 people take a carriage rise in Versailles every year. Uh, and I think that uh, this is wonderful for them all. So there are lots of things that go on at Versailles that have to do with a horse up until the 2024 Olympic Games, where we will be holding the equestrian events. As Coubertin said, we want to also hold a great uh, exhibition of the horse through the ages in art, uh, starting from some of the earliest uh, paintings uh, uh, to the most uh, contemporary ones, one of which you have a horse uh, jumping through the canvas of the painting. Uh, but we hope that we're going to be able to mix up uh, sports and culture it's never an easy task to do that. Uh, uh, the, the world of art is, or the world of, uh, uh, the world of art always uh, has a connotation of being slightly more snobbish, whereas the world of uh, culture is more popular. So these 2024 Olympic Games should, uh, uh, they will take place on the, 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 the royal uh, circle in, in the main alley of Versailles in front of the Grand Canal. And there we will be able to have dressage and show jumping, but the eventing will take place throughout the entire park. So you'll have to cross over the canal. We've actually done tests uh, near Deauville to come up with floating barches, a bit like Churchill did, so that we can get horses to go across the uh, canal. Uh, we don't want any horses to fall into the canal. But I think that there are going to be some quite remarkable things to see. And maybe uh, after having seen Top Gun, many people wanted to be fighter pilots. And maybe after having seen horses in Versailles, many uh, youngsters will want to be horse riders. We hope so. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. But we also say that the horse is an animal like no other. We've talked about the horse being productive, the horse being a, a friend. The horse is nonetheless different from other animals. I would advise you to read a book written by Marc Aliza, which is called Dog. And in this book, which he wrote after his dog died and he was devastated, he said that dogs are closer to men than monkeys. Now, we know that as far as uh, DNA is concerned, that is not true. But the dog has actually changed the be the, its behavior based on man's uh, behavior. Uh, the, the dog will actually turn to look at what you are looking at uh, simply because of the years that they have spent with us. A monkey won't do that. And I think that the horse, which is something between uh, culture and uh, nature and domestic uh, animal and working animal. I think above all of this, it's very important to think that this horse has been living with us for uh, thousands of years. And uh, I think that we should maybe step out of the box, do away with stereotypes. Alfred de Vigny. Uh, wrote poems about animals, and he wrote about the wolf that is a wild animal, and the dog that uh, uh, the dog that uh, has subjected itself to man mankind. But uh, 
the dog is the one that uh, has almost uh, uh, signed a contract with uh, mankind. There aren't many wolves left today. There are still a lot of uh, dogs. Uh, Aristotle said that agriculture is what actually detaches us from nature, whereas the horse reattaches us to nature. If a horse comes back to Versailles, I hope that we will be able to take a closer interest uh, uh, of living uh, uh, with living with these horses every day. And I remember somebody else who said, we do not have two hearts, one for mankind and one for animals. You either have a heart or you don't have a heart. Thank you very much. I told you we would finish off with a bang. Do we have any questions for, any time for questions or are we really very late? Mr. Luca. I'm not going to talk about Versailles, fear not, but it's to talk uh, more about uh, Pardubice, because between Saumur and Pardubice, there is a story. There is a Frenchman who won in Pardubice in 1948 riding Rayon de Lune, and he was called Captain Maurice Buré, and he was... Uh, he worked here uh, at the Cadre Noir, and he also won a gold medal, a team gold medal in the London Olympic Games. Madam Director, are there any other questions? No. I think everybody's hungry. How can they be hungry? We've already had two coffee breaks with all sorts of little tidbits. Well, if there truly are no other questions, going, going, gone. All that remains to be done is to thank all of the participants uh, in this round table. They have uh, given us uh, different flavors this afternoon, poetic ones, cultural ones. And thank you very much, Jean-Louis. And we are now going to move uh, on to the conclusion of uh, today's event. Mark Van Tyne was meant to be concluding today, but as you've understood, uh, he is not here for an excellent uh, reason. So I'm going to call on Florence Grasse, Paul Kahn, uh, and Rolly Owers, please. Who are going to stand in together and give us the conclusion of today. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have been asked uh, as uh, members uh, to actually conclude uh, this uh, day, a day that has been fascinating, poetic, and as we all participated in one round table, we wanted to give you a very brief summary of each round table and uh, also come up with one or two uh, requests. The last uh, conference uh, on the horse in 2009 under the Swedish presidency, they also ended with requests and uh, left a heritage. And the heritage was the creation of the European Horse Network. And uh, it was an attempt to work together and coordinate things uh, on a European level. I think we have done a lot towards that since 2009. So are we ready today to commit to something else? 
to something uh, that could be a next step to something that is concrete under the French presidency and thanks to this conference. I think we need to, to leave some type of heritage in the wake of each conference. So I will give the floor now to Roly Owers for the conclusion of the first round table, please. And uh, then we'll have the others. Florence, thank you very much. Um, I will keep this very brief. I think the, the, the first um, workshop, there was a number of very similar themes that uh, came through. And I think the relevance of equines to society today was something that shone through. And I think the reality is we, horses still play a huge part in society. But the vast majority of society does not recognize that. And I think we have a responsibility to change that. And I think there's a number of ways that we can do that. And I was uh, very taken by Joran's uh, expression around personal responsibility. Because in society today, it's very easy to say, it's for government to do, it's for the regulator to do, it's for someone else to do. I think it's so important that we take something away from today about what we will do. Um, and nowhere is that more important than in animal welfare and equine welfare. Because, and there are t many, many different reasons why we need to, need to prioritise equine welfare, whether we're talking about horses or equines in agriculture or in sport or in culture or for any other reason. Primarily because it's ethically the right thing to do. But we also know there's many other examples, and agriculture is a, a very good one, where good animal welfare means good uh, equine productivity. And so there's a commercial incentive to do that. And I was very taken what the member of the European Parliament said about how we need to be proud of what we do um, to support and develop equine welfare. And I think that's something equally we need to take, take forward. Um, but I also need to, you know, I think there are many aspects where we can do a lot better. And I think, again, we need to reflect on where, in fact, there are some real issues that um, really challenge us. And I think the final area of why we need to take more personal responsibility for, for equine welfare, but also which interlinks, as we know, with the health of the, uh, uh, our environment and our own the human health, is the fact that we live in a very changing society. And I think whether we are using horses, especially in agriculture, but possibly more especially in sport, society is increasingly questioning whether that's the right thing to do. So with a great proud voice we have to say that we are doing the right things by our horses but that does involve ensuring that we educate people about how to, to, to ensure we are caring for our horses properly and we need to invest in research just because we've done something with our horses uh, like the commanding officer of the cardinal I said uh, just because we've done something this way for centuries doesn't make it necessarily right. And so we do have to challenge ourselves through the findings of research. And so in the place and the home of the IFCE, I can only say that we do need to invest in research to ensure the future of our equines, our horses, whether that be in agriculture, sport or culture. Thank you. Merci. Thank you very much. So roundtable number two on the uh, social integration, employment uh, and development, rural development. I think that uh, some concrete uh, measures were talked about in this roundtable, things that have been done by the Senate, by the National, French National Assembly, by IFCE with Equi Ressources and also amongst local players. So these uh, different concrete things have shown that there is a true resolve to coordinate in order to promote uh, the horse sector and the very important impact it has on rural development and on employment and uh, to ensure that these, these are jobs that cannot be delocalized, jobs in tourism that, is, that are only just beginning to uh, uh, to, to flourish today, so concrete, concrete actions, coordinating with politicians, this is extremely important. 
uh, horse groups and the different institutions, rep horse representatives of the horse and uh, of the environment and local structures, all of this uh, advocates for concrete structures. And it also shows, we also saw that over a certain number of years, these jobs exist, but it is not easy to put them forward. And uh, yet all it would take uh, would be to, all it took was three people who managed to change uh, the name of the game there and put forward these jobs and make them more accessible. So that second round table showed that coordination is uh, of prime importance and we must continue to do so if we want to promote the horse sector. I'm not going to single out the, uh, the lessons from the last round table because it's only just happened, but I think what's been very clear from all three of the round tables that we've had today is that the unique, uniquely multifaceted way in which the horse and man interact. I don't think we could have had this conference on any other animal other than the horse, but I think maybe the very fact that it is so many different things to so many different people makes it, and therefore it's, it, it makes it so difficult to pigeonhole, that very fact makes it uh, easy for legislators to um, uh, draw a veil over the horse, to overlook the horse, uh, to, to treat it almost as a, an afterthought. We, we've seen how the horse has all the necessary assets to be treated extremely seriously and recognized fully by the public bodies. We've talked about its, its green assets and green credentials, about its agricultural assets, about its, the jobs that, that it, it creates in, in, in rural environments, about its, its role in therapy, about its role in sport, um, its cultural assets, all of these things. But despite all of that, the horse is often marginalized in legislation. And we think that one way to address this, as Florence has said earlier, is to have better data, objective data. And one thing that we would like to see and we would like to call for is to have a Eurostat study on the horse sector. That would be one uh, takeaway message, I think, that we would want to leave. And the other, I think, is that um, Another effect of the horse's lack of profile in legislators' eyes is that we within the European Horse Network are constantly guarding against unintended consequences of the legislation. By that I mean that laws that are entirely sensible for other farm animals may be completely inappropriate uh, for the horse so please recognize the specificity of the horse. Um, and laws that may be entirely appropriate for some horses in some situations, for example, um, to do with transport to slaughter, may be entirely inappropriate for other horses in other situations, for example, uh, competing in top sports events or horse races. So please also, recognize the intra-species uh, diversity of this extraordinary animal, the horse. 